Welcome everyone. Welcome back from your break. Um, my name is Amber Huey. I am the Knowledge Translation Specialist with the Mesh Methods Clusters at the um, Vancouver Hub. I'm pleased to be your host this morning for our one hour breakout session. Um, you'll see now that we're using Zoom meetings um, rather than the webinar format that we were looking at before. Um, so we, don't, we do not have a Q&A. Um, please use the chat function for questions throughout the sessions uh, to communicate with us. Please include who your question or your comments are for, so we know that um, so that our presenters can respond. Um, and that's it for housekeeping. Let's get started. I am pleased to pass the unmute button to Danielle Lavalli, our scientific director for the BCHSN, and our scientific lead for the methods clusters. Over to you. Thanks, Amber. And I appreciate that tip of I pass the unmute button over to you. So now we can remind ourselves to unmute because I'm, I'm a constant offender of that. Um, welcome to everybody who's joined us today. We're, we're looking forward to hopefully what will be a, a just a, a great chat session. I have two slides just to orient the group to what we're going to be talking about. Then I'm going to stop screen share um, and then you'll see our faces. Uh, to echo Amber, I, I would encourage people to use the Q&A or the chat function for asking questions so we can make this as much of a dialogue as possible. Um, so for those of you who might be new to the methods clusters, um, I wanna share with you kind of a little bit of an overview about the work um, of this group. So um, the, the methods clusters were actually gifted to me from Sterling and this, this lovely group here who, who really have spent the last four years um, really thinking about what are the different areas where we need to build patient-oriented research and what, what might that look like. So since um, the, these initiatives began, um, each cluster has worked to, uh, their, the names of the clusters are listed here in the slide. I'm gonna ask each person to um, introduce themselves and tie themselves with their respective cl cluster momentarily. But just know that each body of work has really focused on involving patients and other stakeholders in really developing the themes and directions that um, the projects they funded have moved towards over the past few years. So there's 42 funded projects in total across the um, respective clusters. Amber's gonna post a link to the full list of projects that are funded by the clusters. The names you see here are um, examples of projects that are funded within each specific cluster. Over 100 patients have been involved both in the development of the theme areas as well as um, participating in the projects themselves. And the work represents a portfolio of about $4.8 million that has been invested in really the science of um, patient-oriented research in these different ways. Um, if you joined us last night, you, you heard me say how, um, how much I've enjoyed learning about the work of these respective clusters because they're touching on points around um, patient involvement in research that I don't think we, we really thought about past the how do you create partnerships, but really the values and the underpinnings of um, what we do as researchers. How do we do that better now that we're um, expanding our teams to include the patient and public voice? I know a number of you um, here attending today may have had a role in these, so as we go, I would, rec I would uh, request that you offer your insights and viewpoints as well. Um, so the goal of this session is, is really meant to engage these researchers in both reflecting and projecting um, what has changed in their own work and their own views as a result of really thinking in depth about patient-oriented research within their respected, um, their respected groups. I recognize that we don't have a patient partner on this panel and it's somewhat intentional to get people to really think about what do they do differently and what have they seen change fundamentally about research in this context. Um, perhaps next year we flip the methods uh, session on its head and we have all patient partners talking about the methods work um, just to change it up a bit. Um, I, I want to, as we pivot to quick introductions of discussion, I do want to acknowledge Sterling, who I don't think needs an introduction, but um, has, has really been the leader in this, and, and it's been my, um, my luck to be able to come, uh, come on at a time where I, I kind of just get to run across the finish line, and, and he has, has really helped conceptualize and um, bring this work forward. So recognizing that, Sterling, what additional context would you add or things would you highlight for the group today? Yeah, I, I, I mean, thanks very much, and, and it's it's uh, it's such a uh, such a, a thrill, really, to be at the point we're at. Um, like the idea originally was that we we actually wanted to build an evidence base on how to do patient-oriented research well, um, and like that was the that was the motivating factor in taking the methods clusters forward. It's like a recognition that 
the future is patient-oriented research, period, um, and we want that to be the case. Uh, but we want to be evidence-based in our decision-making about how to, con uh, how to conduct patient-oriented research. And so, um, so yeah, I was delighted that, uh, that, that we were able to carve out budget in order to, uh, to try and develop that evidence base and, uh, and bring, uh, bring some uh, fabulous folks in to support and be part of that. Uh, and, and now the, yeah, the, the, uh, the fruit is, uh, is being uh, harvested, I guess, uh, to some extent. Um, or at least we're at a point where we're beginning to see that, which is uh, just incredibly exciting. So, uh, yeah, I'm just delighted that we're at this stage and uh, delighted that uh, we, uh, we have an opportunity to share that today. Thanks, Sterling. Um, so I'm going to turn to the panel now and I'm going to just to help orient everybody to who is talking about what specific cluster. We've asked each person in their um, name to add the specific group just as a reminder. Um, and Amber has also placed in the chat box a link to the website where you can read more about the clusters and the individuals themselves. But for this morning, I, I'll call on each of you if you could introduce yourself and um, your affiliation in the cluster that you represent. That would be fantastic. So Linda, you're right next to me in the, the Holly Wood Square, so why don't you start? Thank you, Danielle. Uh, my name is Linda Lee. I am a professor in the Department of Physical Therapy at, at the University of British Columbia, and I am the Methods cluster, cluster Lead for Knowledge Translation and Implementation Science. Thanks, Linda. Nick, how about you? Hey, uh, Nick Brantak. I'm uh, the Asso Associate Professor in the School of Population and Public Health at UBC, and I co-lead the Health Economics and Simulation Modeling Methods Cluster. Thanks, Erin. Good morning, everybody. Joining you from Hoi Sam or Roberts Creek on the Sunshine Coast, where I live. I'm a professor in psychiatry at UBC and the Patient Engagement Methods Cluster Lead. Thanks, Erin. Hubert? Good morning, everyone. I'm Hubert Wong. I'm an associate professor in the School of Population and Public Health at UBC. Uh, though I spend most of my time with the uh, Canadian HIV Trials Network down at St. Paul's Hospital. Excellent. Thanks, Hubert. And Rick, last but not least. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Rick Stawatsky. I'm a professor at the School of Nursing at Trinity Western University and a scientist at the Center for Health Evaluation and Outcome Sciences at St. Paul's Hospital. And I lead the patient-centered measurement mock cluster together with um, Lena Cuthbertson, who is the advisor uh, for this methods cluster, and she's the executive director um, of the Office of Patient-Centered Measurements of the BC Ministry of Health. Thanks, Rick. And I, I do want to acknowledge Kim McGrail as well. She was unable to join us today, but she leads the Health Informatics Methods Cluster, or the, sorry, the Data Science and Health Informatics Methods Cluster. Um, so she's not represented here, but if questions come up, um, I'll look to the team to um, try and fill in where needed. Um, so I do have questions prepared uh, to help facilitate discussion, but that's really just to create a conversation amongst um, the, the folks on the, uh, on the call today. I, I really do hope people add questions to um, the, the chat box as we go, because um, I know that everybody wants to answer the questions you have, not necessarily the questions that I have. Um, so I, we're going to start the discussion in more of a reflective uh, space. Um, and, and I'm really curious about what, if any changes occurred in the thinking of our, our researchers here um, and views on or about science as a result of helping to facilitate the work within the diverse areas that are represented today. So Nick, I'm going to start with you. A number of projects in your portfolio of work address preferences and values. How has taking a patient-oriented approach shaped or changed your thinking or perhaps that of your group? Thanks. Uh, thanks, Danielle. Uh, a tricky question to start with. Um, but I, th I think I've been reflecting on this and um, I think there's a few levels that we've changed or had our thinking shaped in sort of the 13 projects now that we've funded in our cluster. I think in one, on one level, uh, like Stephanie Harvard has led this uh, project where she's got a really shone a light on the value judgments that economists make like often unknowingly we just sort of do them because it's what we've always done or we're taught we never really thought that these are actual value judgments so i think um the work that she's done has really helped us think about the assumptions that we make the frameworks that we 
we use. Um, and I think it's been really helpful for help our community sort of rethink and sort of get input on are those actually the, the right frameworks and assumptions um, that, that we should be using? Do they really consider um, the, sort of the, the patients that we're um, trying to do the work for? But then I think there's on another level, there's some kind of evidence on preferences and values that some of our projects have generated. I'm thinking uh, Jude, Jude Cornelson's work on the costs, the out-of-pocket costs for people living in rural communities um, Wei Zhang has done work on the, the lost productivity costs from caregivers. And I think that changes the way we think about the, the evidence that we generate for to inform policy decisions, which, which often just don't don't consider these these preferences and values, and um, kind of lead to the inequities in 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 care that that we provide. Um, so, so yeah, and I think on the, maybe on a last level, um, I think of Mark Harrison's work on sort of patient preferences in clinical trial design. I think this is one where we just, we weren't sure quite how to engage patient partners in some of these quite often complicated statistical decisions. Like how do we really do that? And I think our learning there has been, you absolutely can, and it just, means that you have to um, articulate and and actually trying to uh, communicate what you're tr what you're really trying to do what are the objectives and that that project has just been so rich in terms of um, new ways of thinking about how trials can be designed uh, such that patients actually want to be part of them so I think there's different layers that that our, our thinking has changed and I'll be happy to sort of follow up on any of those ideas if, if people have any kind of questions. Thanks for that. Does anybody else on the, uh, the panel group, Sterling, I know you're a health economist um, by training, so would welcome you to chime in uh, as well here. I'm a health economist by practice as well. But, uh, <laughs> um, uh, so I, I, think, I think one of the things that I, I've been, like, you know, I, I think really sort of found particularly um, important and challenging in the work of the health economics uh, and simulation modeling cluster has been around communication of the sort of core um, ideas of economics to uh, to patients and, and the public. Um, and in some ways, I think like, you know, this is at the heart of the challenge of patient-oriented research in some contexts is um, how do we, you know, I mean, like, economics is about making tough decisions. Um, and it means that in some situations, we're going to support adoption of, 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 a, of a therapy or whatever. Uh, and, and in other situations, we're going to choose not to do that, even though that therapy might provide benefit. Um, and, and that's sort of like real, like sort of the, 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 is, is at the crux of what economics is about is, is scarcity and, and actually making really difficult decisions. So I think the work that's been done to try and uh, build bridges and, and, and effective forms of communication I think has been is is is, is particularly uh, important and powerful. Um, so I don't know whether Nick, you want to speak to some of the the work that's happening in that sort of space. But uh, you know, I certainly think that's going to be going to be really uh, you know a, a major contribution that's made from from the work as well. Yeah, well, I think we've we've created a a, a whole series of of short videos of different kind of formats, including whiteboards and. Um, other, other other types to just try and sort of um, bring patients kind of in to sort of like uh, the why why they should be speaking with economists and I realise that's not often a, uh, an, an easy sell so um, uh, I think that's that's been one of the things and then still we're still working with potentially trying to create a documentary that would be something that would be accessible for the public to sort of really bring them in to the decisions. And actually, like COVID is, you know, who knew that we'd be talking about simulation models and, and models and assumptions and hearing about value judgments as much as we did um, as we are in, in the current environment. So I really think there's uh, opportunities for some of the, the, the learning and the communication that we have um, built to 
to help us and our research community as we as we tackle these these important issues. Thanks, Nick. And I see Jennifer is on online, and I think Sterling called out last night that there's a mixer for health economists and patients who are interested in um, learning more, if I'm not mistaken. So a great opportunity to continue the conversation there just to give a plug for that event. Um, Hubert, I'm actually going to turn to you, and, and Nick spoke a little bit about the involvement of patient partners in the development of clinical trials, and um, certainly work in real-world clinical trials or ways in which we can embed clinical trial methodologies in practice has, has been an area of conversation in the, um, uh, in the research world. So how has your thinking about what embedded clinical trials should or could look like in, in reality over the, course of uh, over the course of time changed? Uh, thanks, Dale. Um, I, I, I was going to follow up on uh, Nick's comments, uh, but, uh, but let me just sort of step back a bit and, and think about sort of the, the history of how this has all evolved. Uh, I mean, if you go back even, say, 10, maybe 15 years ago, the, this whole notion of even a, a real-world trial or a pragmatic trial was, was hardly known at all. Uh, I, I mean, you know, sitting on the CHR review panels, for example, I mean, it, all the trials that were coming through were like, okay, here's a very specific targeted population. We're going to um, consent people, uh, randomize them to make sure that the, the two groups are balanced that we're trying to compare, and uh, you know, define some sort of uh, clinical endpoint as being the, the driving force behind this trial, and evaluate that at the, at the end of the trial. And, and you know, the, this whole notion of things like, uh, well, are you sure that the people you have in your trial represent what's happening in the real world, people in the real world, and things like, you know, A, may, A is A better than B for everyone, or is it that some treatments are better, or some treatment is better for people in A? Some, sorry, some people do better on A, but other people do better on B. These, these are questions we were, which were not considered at all in, in these trials. And, and so now you fast forward to what we've been trying to do in these past few years. Uh, well, th that's sort of what the uh, pro projects in the methods cluster have been trying to tackle. And so th this whole notion uh, where Nick was talking about, you know, trial design and how do we tease out these things? Um, well, I think that's, that's what we're trying to do going forward or what we have to do going forward is say that, you know, our trials are not aimed to look at what's happening in a very narrow population and trying to answer a single clinical question but to actually figure out you know, what is it that patients care about and how do we ensure that these concerns are embedded in the trial. Okay. Uh, and so we're not there yet, I don't think. I, I mean, you know, do we routinely collect patient, or, uh, patient reported outcomes, patient experience measures you know, in our databases? Well, I don't think so. Um, the, the question is, how do we do that? Uh, it, right now we are doing trials, these real world trials are on a one-off basis. Every investigator, investigator goes out there and uh, designs and conducts their trial um, based on sort of uh, reinventing the wheel almost. And I, I think we, what we need to do is really formalize that process within our healthcare system to say, okay, you know, if, a if an investigator wants to run a trial, how can we make it easy for them to do that in this real, real world context? And, and so I think that's, uh, I mean, th th that's where this conversation should be. You know, how do we do that? I agree. I think that um, you know, the evidence in practice is always changing and every clinician, every patient wants to know what's the right what's the right treatment for me given, given that this new medication is out or this new treatment is out and, and how do you know? And I think as we look forward, the, the opportunity to really Im, Im, embed that thinking and work collectively to figure out how we can create um, evidence faster that people um, believe reflects what, what practice looks like and what outcomes are important is gonna be a critical, critical component. Would anybody else on the panel like to comment on that? And certainly, um, if folks have thoughts or comments, um, please add those to the chat box. Okay. Rick, I'm gonna um, now turn to you because Hubert actually brought up patient-centered measurement. 
Um, and I know that your cluster has, foc has funded a number of projects focused on the capture and the use of patient-centered measures moving beyond practice into clinical care. Can you speak to how the process for the patient-centered measurement cluster undertook, uh, the, the process that you undertook influenced the research direction pursued? Yes, thank you. And I apologize for not, not being able to turn on my video due to low bandwidth here, it's just so the attendees are aware. <laughs> it's not that I want to hide myself. Um, but in any case, um, yeah, so I think one of the main learnings has come out of, um, out of the focus groups that we did with, with patients early on in the, in the formation, the process of forming our cluster priority themes. So we went throughout the province and we went locally through, to each of the regional health areas or health authority areas um, and held six, seven focus groups with patients and family caregivers um, 74 of them. And out of that, we identified a number of themes. And uh, you could read about them on our, our webpage, which has now been wonderfully updated. And you could look there and see the descriptions of the 10 projects that have been funded as a result of listening to patients and family caregivers about what their concerns are uh, and priorities are in relation to patient-centered measurement. But there's a couple of things I've learned um, about the process of doing so. Um, one is, uh, well, one of the themes that just really stood out for me is um, ensuring that people feel safe. I had actually not considered that theme a priori. Um, it really came out of our conversations and I was struck that at every single focus group, there was at least one or two and sometimes more people in tears. Uh, I mean, you know, speaking about measurement, um, typically when I talk to measure about measurement with people, it's not something that invokes tears. And yet in this context, it has, and people were, uh, concerned for various reasons. They were concerned that their reporting could have a, a retaliatory effect. Uh, they were concerned that it may affect their healthcare in ways that they had not intended. Uh, they were concerned about how their data were being used. Um, for instance, in every focus group, we also had an indigenous person, at least one, and we had an entire focus group uh, with the First Nations Health Authority as well. And of course, data governance comes out uh, in that context. Uh, who decides what data is being collected and for what purposes and how that data is going to be used. That really st stood out for me. It's not, not fundamentally a new thing, but it really in affects the process. Because then if we think about the process of measurement, how do we decide what to measure? Well, typically that's decided by, depending on why we measure, it's decided by government, or it's decided by healthcare professionals, mostly physicians, or it's decided by researchers. But in the patient-oriented context, who should actually be deciding what we're measuring and then how we're measuring and who has access to that data. So one of our second themes, for instance, is the theme of patient-driven measurement. This is the idea of where patients articulated how they actually wanted to be in the driver's seat. They wanted to control who has access to what data. And um, if we then now look again at our typical platforms, for instance, our data platforms, our electronic medical records, or other data platforms, they are not controlled by patients. In fact, patients typically just have a viewer portal access. They can't really change any of the data. They can't change who has access to it or whatnot. Um, but they can only view it <laughs> if they're lucky. Um, many systems can't even be accessed by patients at all. They're fully controlled by your healthcare system. And so that I think has huge implications for process. If we wanna change that and become truly patient oriented and truly patient centered and truly patient driven, then that whole system actually needs to change. And we have some examples of that internationally. Uh, when we look at Denmark, for instance, where they're collecting, have the, a bit more of a patient managed uh, national a health data platform could be an example. So I think that has implications for when we use 
this data that are being collected in our data platforms for research and policy and health uh, system purposes. Um, okay, I could just keep on going for, I have no idea where, what time it is. <laughs> so maybe I'll just pause there and leave it there and uh, happy to say more. <laughs> No, I think that those are those are great points. I think there's a lot still to be learned about measurement and um, how do we ensure that the measures that are often developed in the context of research um, actually enhance uh, care that's provided and, and doesn't actually cause harm um, is one component. And then I think how data gets used, especially in the clinical um, the clinical area, really thinking about user-centered design and how do we design with how people interfa interface and interact with data. And I'm sorry, Kim's not here to talk about the informatics component. Um, because I think that that's going to be an area for future is how do we work together as teams to, to design care so it, it provides people the information they need to have to make decisions when they need to make decisions. Um, but it, it also um, brings a great opportunity to pivot towards um, uh, citizen science. So I'm, I'm actually going to reach out to Linda now um, and, and ask you to speak to one of the projects that's coming from uh, the Knowledge Translation Cluster, which is work on the citizen science platform that recently launched. Can you give a brief description uh, of what you envision for the platform and its future growth? Thank you, Danielle. I, I'm really excited to have, to have the opportunity to talk about the Citizen Science Project. This is actually one of the five projects that are um, supported by the KT and Implementation Science Methods Cluster. Um, I see that Nelly Oki is here and Matt McLeod are also here. Uh, in the audience, and they are leading two of the really interesting projects, one on um, deliberative dialogue, and Mather is leading a project on uh, her hermeneutics, as well as uh, Ellen Bass is doing um, system thinking tools, and uh, Sarah Monroe uh, is doing some really interesting work in documentary um, to reach the hard to reach population. But back to citizen science. I'm particularly excited about it because this is really the um, a joint project, jointly supported by our methods cluster as well as the uh, data science and health informatics methods cluster. And, and this partnership really reflects the common interest of the two clusters in exploring new methods to engage patients and the public in co-developing research questions. So just reflecting back on how we came up with this idea, and, and I think this, it based on this really, this nagging question that, I mean, if you ever think of how researchers formulate research questions, right? Oftentimes they set out to answer queries that, are, um, that, that they are curious about, but with this approach, the patient and the public's perspectives are missing. And when it comes to health research, we know that patients are key in understanding you know, the, um, the health trends. So, but a lot of people with different health conditions, they, they don't have a good idea how to get involved with research. So in the citizen science project, our team of researchers, mainly from UBC and Simon Fraser, partner with uh, a team of patients, uh, including Cheryl Cohen, Delia Cooper, and uh, Sunny Liu, um, as well as Alison Holmes, who is an amazing um, knowledge broker. And we work with a technology partner called Tactica Interactive. So this huge team came together and developed an online platform, which is currently held, uh, hosted by Population Data BC. So anyone can sign on this platform with a computer or a smartphone. Um, all you need to do is to go to patientscientist.ca, which if I can do it successfully, it's on the ch in the chat box for anybody who's interested. So when you get into the website, you, um, you'll be asked to answer some questions, simple health questions um, about your health, um, and to share your theories about managing health. So in the citizen, sci the citizen science platform was launched in, um, we had a soft launch in August 2020, which means that we put it out there, we, you know, slowly telling the public that it's out there, but we, we haven't even um, started um, uh, do, doing um, major um, uh, promotion. We currently have about 100, 110 people actively using the website right now. Um, and in the first iteration, the theme that we're focus, focusing on is to uncover the burden of pain. 
can't say the word, so uncover the burden of pain. So the plan is really to invite everyone um, who is interested to share their pain experiences, uh, especially during the time of COVID-19, of course. Um, so looking forward, we're working with Kim McGrail and her team in data science and health informatics methods cluster. We will start exploring the data, creating visualizations, and sharing, sharing them back on the platform for the public to provide feedback on whether the information resonates with them in the next six to eight months. So what we will then do is to use this information to refine the questions that are asked on the platform, and this will be a bit of an iterative process. And then in the next two to three years, that will allow us to um, start exploring the quantitative and the qualitative data that are being collected um, in this platform in order for us to identify specific research questions that are related to the burden of pain. Now, the citizen science platform is flexible, so we can expand to cover different uh, themes in the future. And we welcome anyone um, who may be interested in using this data in generating patient-oriented research questions to work with us. Um, we, we have created a whiteboard video to explain the project, so um, I, I'm going to share that in the chat box in a moment, and I would um, really invite everyone to take a look at it, share with your contact, and if you have any questions, I am more than happy to, um, to answer that if we have time. Thanks, Linda. And in fact, you did get the first question of the panel, so the, the price goes to you. Um, and the question comes from Angela, and she's asking, do you want people only from BC entering data or just anyone, even from the states? Anyone in, around the world. Uh, in fact, we just looked at the data this morning. I think we have uh, quite a number of people from the Netherlands and, and, the, and Sweden, I think. Netherlands, for sure. Um, for some reason, we, you know, they, they caught uh, the, uh, the, the, the soft launch and uh, <laughs> starting to um, using the website. One of the things that was interesting, if anybody is doing work in citizen science, is that the government of Canada actually has a citizen science portal to list citizen science projects. We didn't know that. We, when we were doing the, the soft launch, we just came across this website. So um, if you have a citizen science type of project, you can actually contact them and have your website listed. And I think that actually helped us to bring the project outside of BC um, to include anyone who may be interested. Thanks for that, Linda, and thanks for um, helping to bring together such a great um, uh, project. Beverly or Bev has a question. Citizen science, is that the same as patient initiated? That's a good question. Um, I, I think there, there's overlapping, those two overlapping concepts. Um, when we talk about citizen science, we are really um, talking about working with people um, who are typically labeled as the public or non-scientists to work together and create new knowledge. So um, in what we're doing in citizen science project, we're asking people to tell us about their health tell us about their theory, about how they manage their pain. Um, and together we're trying to find, you know, interesting, um, you know, topics for, you know, further research. When we talk about patient-initiated initi um, type of research, and I think Aaron probably can speak a lot better than I can, is, is really um, around having people to um, take the lead and, um, and, 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 you know, bring forth interesting questions and, and taking leadership in designing and, and, and conducting the project. So that, that's sort of my take. Thanks, and that actually is a good segue into Erin, uh, because patient engagement is the cluster we haven't talked about yet, but certainly is the concept that is cross-cutting across all of our work and kind of the, the thread that, that ties us all together. So Erin, um, what are you most excited and energized by as you look forward um, in approaches to patient engagement? And, and I ask that question with such enthusiasm for the work that you, and I know Iva's on, um, uh, that your teams, the projects that you funded have led, uh, led in this area. So could you, could you speak to what you're excited about when you look forward around patient involvement? Thank you. I'll note that Bev Pomeroy is also on the line as well as a foundational partner for one of the projects that I'll tell you a little bit about. Um, 
you know, to be honest, I, I was reflecting on this. After three years of, it's been a whirlwind of work. It's been three years since the patient engagement methods cluster got up on its feet and um, the timelines were quite tight and there was so much work to be done. I'm super excited right now to stop, to breathe, not stop working, but to stop and take a step back and to have the opportunity to reflect and come back it up to a bit more of a, a meta picture, to stand back and look at some of the bigger messages from the different projects that we're learning both in the patient engagement methods cluster and in the projects that we're sharing across different clusters and then more broadly from the work of the BC support unit um, beyond that. Because um, of course, yeah, patient engagement is the, um, you know, it's the MO, modus operandi of all of the work that we do is our bread and butter, right? Um, and so to be at this point in time now where I think we're just able to come to that reflection point, um, I think Sterling used the phrase about it being harvest time. Um, and it does kind of feel like that to me, but I feel like um, we're harvesting fruits from all these different trees and they're kind of laid out in front of us. And I'm not sure yet what the dominant flavors are going to be from the, from the dishes that we're going to make with them. Um, and that's the point that I'm really looking forward to now in, in collaboration with, with the other methods, cluster leads and the patient partners who have been involved. Um, and collectively coming together to see how our work can help incrementally address some of those perennial and really um, pressing questions in the field of patient engagement. Um, and I'm not naive enough to think that we're going to be able to do anything other than incrementally advance that dialogue and that conversation and the evidence on effective and authentic patient engagement. Um, but I think we've got some good ingredients to kind of to inch it to inch it forward. Um, and just hearing this conversation today, you can start to see some of those, um, some of those themes come out. Rick talked about safety and harm from engagement and research or historically. And that's something that's been very prominent for us in the patient engagement methods cluster. Um, you might remember that we had a very strong drive towards supporting um, all, all of our work over the last three years has been looking at supporting um, inclusion of more diverse uh, voices in, in health research provincially. Um, and when I stop and think about what that process has been like, um, you asked us to do a bit of a numbers count on, in our clusters on the number of, of, of patients involved in our various projects. And we're looking at, you know, it's not a definitive number, but maybe 30 or 40 sort of um, centrally involved patient partners. Only about 10% of those are people who actually had any relationship or even knew of the support unit before we started. They probably didn't even know what sports stood for. Um, so they're really fresh to, to engagement and research. And that's fantastic. And that's one of the things that we really, want, really wanted to do through the PE cluster, but it also came uh, with some considerations in that, um, you know, these weren't people necessarily that we had foundations of trust built with um, and many of them had been really damaged and harmed um, by research and by healthcare previously and um, I think that there will be meta messages from all of our clusters around as we you know as we try to open the doors to patient engagement really wide um, and open them to people who face really stark structural and systemic systematic barriers to engagement what do we have to do to um, you know, to do that appropriately and safely and in a way that doesn't cause more harm potentially. Um, so that's something that we're thinking, thinking hard about in our cluster. Yeah, and I would just echo, you know, this morning's keynote presentation by Dr. Horsebeep, um, the, you know, the, the well intention of, of moving research forward, um, but the entropy that can be caused when you try and create new networks and it's, it's driven by the angle that, that you come at and what disruption can there be, what harm can you cause when you don't think about the, the right way to engage. Um, and I, I think that, that point about reflecting on what we've done, what's gone well, what hasn't gone well, um, where do we need to go and, and how do we do that as a community is, um, is critical so that we, we continue to make positive advancements in the field. Um, so I, I echo that and I look forward to those continued conversations moving forward.
and reflecting critically on the things that went wrong and being frank and open and transparent about that. That's, that's the key too, I think. Yes, Pro problem solving with an open heart, I think was the, the one of the key takeaways from this morning. Um, I, I know patient engagement has been cross-cutting throughout. Would anybody else like to chime in on um, the evaluation or reflection you've done as part of that work within your own cluster? Okay, I'm going to move to our next question, um, which is actually meant for the full panel. And, you know, I think one of the, the, the threads that, that cross cuts both the session this morning, today, and actually if you join us later for our second methods cluster, you'll see the theme there. It's around communication. Uh, I think how we communicate about science, who we reach in the process has certainly shifted uh, immensely, it feels like in the last year, especially around COVID and how people are seeking information and sharing information for better or for worse. Um, but it's not something in science that we're formally trained in. We're trained in writing relatively dry at times, unless you're a, a very good, good scientific writer, um, peer-reviewed publications that only hit a certain audience. Um, and, and now we're really actively trying to shift that and trying to think about how do we reach people more broadly, more, how are we more engaging? That's in our writing, we're creating web platforms. Um, we all have social media accounts for better or for worse for this purpose. So I'm curious for each of you, um, how has your process shifted? Um, what aspects of communications um, have, have you adapted to um, and what has scared you the most? And I will go, Erin, um, you're on the screen. So I'm going to start with you just because I'm staring right at you. And then I will um, pick people at randomly just to keep them on their toes. You have to contextualize this within COVID, of course, right? And um, I've been thinking a lot around, you know, I have never been scared of online digital forms of communication. It's felt felt like home, but at the same time, it's also the one that scares me the most. And that I think that COVID, if for good and bad, has pushed us into new spaces online in a way that wouldn't have happened otherwise. And it opened up doors of opportunity as part of that. Um, but it's also really opens up avenues for just in enhancing the digital divide that we see. Um, I'm so happy that the sessions are being recorded for this meeting because Shelley Ben David and Sky Barrack and their youth partners are, co -pre are presenting right now on ways to help youth navigate the digital divide so that they can engage with research. Um, but we're in a time um, where we have so many issues around disclosure, social media, information that's out that you can't pull back, use of data um, that have ramifications for patient engagement. It's a, it's a scary and cool space to work in. <laughs> Understandable. Linda, what would you add to um, Aaron's comments? Yeah, I, um, reflecting on the question around communication, well, um, I think it, I, I, I personally am really lucky is to be surrounded by people who are really amazing communicators. I'm looking at Amber, um, I'm looking at Allison, you know, these are wonderful knowledge brokers and, 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 and a position like this, if you ask 10 years ago, um, it, it, it did not exist. And I, I'm just so pleased that, you know, um, the, the knowledge brokering, knowledge brokerage, you know, um, type of work is um, really taken seriously and, um, and, and it helps science communication a great deal and a lot of the great knowledge brokers work with journalists, work with um, people in the media, with social media that really help us to get our words out. I'm also looking at Eileen Davidson. Um, sorry to call you all Eileen. Um, she's one of the patient partners and, um, and, and an amazing blogger. Um, and, and when Eileen writes something, I know it can reach a population where I, there's no way I can reach myself because I'm not a part of it. And, and I think it really speaks to um, the broadening the scope of um, who are the people um, that need to be included at the table and the kind of skills that's needed um, to, to, you know, keep up with the um, technology, with different ways to communicate and to be able to reach different groups in different ages and different cultures. Thanks for that, Linda. You, you brought up um, something that made me think one of the, the first patient partner I, I worked with, who was a co-lead on a project of mine, also was a writer for a local newspaper. 
And um, she made me aware of how woefully inadequate my, my concise writing was. Uh, every time I would write a letter as part of research or we would present our results, uh, she took such a hard red line to things that I wrote and it was always for the better. Um, so I, I know I learned a lot from her, not only from her, her lived experience, but just how to be a better, um, better writer. So I always appreciate when we have people who can partner and shape us in, in other ways outside of the, the research context we might be focused on. Nick, what would you add from your perspective in communications? Um, I think similar sort of like reflection on self-awareness that I'm not a good communicator for so the, the people that are important to sort of engage. Um, but I'm just remembering uh, uh, one of the, our projects on actually the, the videos that we were creating to try and explain and entice people to be in, interested in health economics we are uh, we are uh, sort of empowered the patient partners to be honest with their feedback of what our first drafts of these videos would be and uh you know i think the empowerment went well because they were incredibly critical of what we had done and i think i think that's the that's been our, our lesson is to is to make sure that the start of those conversations that you are genuine about the patient partner's role and getting to a space where they really feel like they can just say this is going in the wrong direction it was to do that early rather than sort of like be all polite and wait till the end and sort of say oh maybe this isn't quite the right thing has been been really um i'm glad that happened early because it changed the course and the way that that those um, videos and communications um, have been and you know we, we chose a little similarly our patient partners are, are great communicators and so they are uh, have been far better at, at developing those than, than we we would have been thanks hubert would you add anything from your perspective on communications yeah so i i think um many of the projects in uh, the real world uh, clinical trial cluster is very technical and mathematical oriented and you know, for most of us, you know, you ask us five years ago, have you ever written a plain language summary? Most of us would say no. <laughs> so, so even that sort of baby step is a big leap for us. Uh, though I, I think maybe going forward, what, what would be important is that however we do this communication, it, it ought to be somewhat interactive. You know, it's, it's one thing to write a, a piece that says, okay, here's the explanation. You figure out how to absorb it. It's something different to actually have a conversation and say, okay, well, what didn't you understand and what can we clarify? And, and so that's all possible these days, you know, with uh, blogs and discussion forums and all that. But I, I guess really we just have to figure out some way of implementing that efficiently and, and getting people engaged. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Beth. And there's a question I think it might be targeted um, for you, Hubert. How do you recruit patients to take part in the cluster or in the planning of the trials? Usually it's so mathematical. Yeah, so we, we struggle. I mean, the, the the projects in the cluster haven't all been sort of on mathematical projects. And so, you know, there's there was uh, Nick and Joel Singer's project, um, which it looked at patient preferences. And there's a Anita Ho's project, which is really about uh, uh, ethics and consent. Um, and, and, you know, they've done a really good job of getting people involved. We struggled with the mathematical ones. Um, it's It's very hard to to communicate what is at stake with the mathematics. It, par partly also because it's not so much patient-centered, which perhaps uh, uh, is in itself uh, a, a problem. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I think, you know, th th this, this, I think this targets what I was saying is that, you know, when, when we engage these patients, it's gonna have to be a sort of back and forth if we want it to be meaningful rather than us just saying, oh, you know, here's a summary go do with, with what you will. I'm not sure if I answered that question, but. No, I, th I think that it, it definitely harkens the um, aspect that this is still, uh, there's still so much to do and still so much to learn in terms of effective strategies and, um, and how we continue to advance this field, especially in things that have been deemed um, uh, more inaccessible uh, in terms of clinical trials. So in a space to, to focus on. Rick, I know within the patient-centered measurement cluster, there's been a lot of focus on communication. I think a website was generated at one point. Do you want to speak to your experience shifting from measurement to communications? 
Yeah, for sure. Uh, I mean, measurement is, I think, a, at its core, a form of communication, um, and it's it's actually designed to to bridge some of these gaps. At least that's the intent. Um, but I think I think Hubert um, said something really important about the relational aspects that's really come out for us um, about needing to be able to be responsive uh, to questions that people have and input that people have, and then relay that for different audiences. So what I'd add to that is the need for tailored mess me messaging. Um, and you saw, you mentioned the website that we've come up with, healthyql.com, um, where we tried that to, we worked with a, a, a designer uh, to develop infographics and a video artist as well, as well as a communication scientist um, who uh, uh, was working with the languaging of everything to develop messages about measurements for four different audiences, being at patients and family caregivers, um, being at uh, healthcare uh, professionals, um, being at healthcare leaders, and being at government. And though all of those, each of those audiences want to, uh, of course, um, uh, use patient-oriented measures, patient-reported outcomes or experience measures, they actually do so for different purposes and they have different knowledge types of needs and different ways of messaging and, and different language that they put to it. So my addition to the discussion so far would be the need for tailored message, uh, messaging. And I think we can do a lot of research around that, how to do that effectively. It's not only you know academics versus not academics, it's academics and a whole list of other different types of knowledge users who have all different languages and knowledge needs. Thanks, Rick. And we actually have a question um, directed to you from Travis. How do you provide patient-oriented information about how data will be used in the context of a registry, where the goal is to collect data for future use? Oh boy, that's a, a big question. <laughs> um, so we, we actually struggled that, uh, with that a little bit on our, our website where we try to relay how data are used for uh, both kind of individual level purposes. So for your in-person point of care, like with a physician or other healthcare provider, um, uh, where, and data is also used at aggregate levels for quality improvement type of purposes, or even of government levels as more health systems and policy purposes. Um, so I'd actually really welcome um, you having a look at that site and letting us know if, if we were somewhat successful <laughs> and especially where we were not successful and how we could um, do a better job at that. Thanks, Rick. So Sterling, you're not out of the woods um, for this question because you and I have had the great pleasure of being on, on a podcast, a video podcast uh, curated by the amazing Bev Pomeroy and Lisa Ridgway. Um, so certainly that's pulled me into new places of communication I never thought I would be. And um, I was glad to have a, a partner in crime in that. Um, what are your perspectives in this space? And, and I'd also like to have you kind of close us out with thinking about future directions and, and your call to action uh, to the community for expanding the work that, or the, the foundation of work that's been started. Thanks. Yeah, I, I mean, I think on the communication um, side of things, um, I, I, you know, my, my sort of learning from, from experience recently is like, um, work with people who know what they're doing um, in this space. Because uh, actually, like, you know, it's, it's easy to, to think, oh, this is, this is easy. But then it's easy to fall into the trap of thinking this is easy when in fact, it's really not. Uh, and needs, you know, needs sort of folks who um, yeah, who, who commit to, 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 to doing this and doing this well. So the blog that's been, uh, the Ivor Chung's blog that's been posted on the chat, I think is a great place to go um, because, because Ivor knows exactly what she's doing in this space and is wonderful at, uh, at, at doing that and has produced some amazing uh, tools and, uh, and pointers about how to communicate effectively. So I would really like to talk, to, talk up uh, Ivor's work as well as the work that we're, you know, we're working with, with lots of other partners as well. So I, I think that's my sort of take. And 
Um, yeah, it's forecast. If you have not come across forecast, then where have you been? But like, if you haven't come across forecast, then uh, just Google forecast and you'll come across some, some wonderful uh, podcasts. Uh, um, there's one that's not so good that's got me in it, but anyway, there's, there's, there's lots that are great. Um, and uh, thanks very much, Bev and, and Lisa, for your leadership on, on that, that front. Um, just sort of like reflecting on like where we are and uh, and where we might uh, where we might go and the the the, the harvest uh, analogy seems to have like uh, taken uh, taken hold taken root um, a little bit um, and I think it's worth sort of like just reflecting a little bit on you know what does harvest time harvest time look like um, you know I I think for me like there's 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 sort of like harvesting the messaging around methods research and a patient-oriented approach to methods research you know i, I think like this is this is a wonderful example I, I, and we sort of had a bit of a chat about this last night this is a wonderful example where people said like you know it'll never work like this is this is this is not going to work that you know bringing patients and lived experience to methods research is going to be too big a challenge and um, you know, and I, I think we've proved people wrong. You know, I'm not saying that you know we've we've got like shining success stories throughout. You know, there's been challenges, and Hubert was was pointing to that. But I think fundamentally, we've demonstrated the importance of lived experience in methods research and the uh, appropriateness of bringing lived experience to methods research. Um, and we need to understand how how to do that better. No question. But but I think. You know, we've we've challenged the uh, the naysayers, and I think challenged them very effectively. And I am delighted by that, to be honest. Um, so I think that's one of the harvest sort of pieces for me. Um, it's interesting when Erin was talking about the harvest, she was talking about dishes that she would prepare. Um, when I was thinking about harvest, I was actually thinking about beers and ciders that we would uh, we would make out of this. Uh, and I think, like, of course, the reality is that we need we need all of that. You know, we need sustenance as well as alcohol. Um, uh, I, I think that the, the importance of the knowledge broker comes through very, very strongly in all of this. And what we need to do is make sure that we see this through and we see this through fully uh, and effectively. And, you know, uh, a huge shout out uh, again to, to Alison Holmes and to Amber Huey, who are, have been our knowledge brokers in the methods cluster work. And, uh, you know, there's, a, there's an awful lot of work still to be done in order to really deliver well on this. Um, but I've got every confidence in Amber. She is fabulous. And so thank heavens we have Amber uh, with us as part of our team uh, in order to achieve that. Uh, and then I think like the, the, the you know, the, this sort of issue about safety, uh, like just like sort of just speaks so, like to my heart and, and you know like shakes me a little bit you know when when Rick was highlighting that and I think it, it's uh, it's something that we need to like just think long and hard about is how do we ensure we're conducting health uh, research patient oriented health research in a way that is going to make sure that we're protecting people um, and not placing people into situations that could actually be harmful situations. Because we have this like frame of diversity, which I think you know, is, is just the right thing for us to do. But it does mean that we're actually engaging with people who are very unfamiliar with, with this, this sort of role and people who have potentially um, scenarios and situations that, uh, that could, be, uh, could be harmful uh, for them to, uh, to, to, to recall etc so and then the final thing i'm going to say is the uh piece around indigenous health research and that, that is a particular emphasis in phase two for the support unit and i'm very conscious that uh you know we haven't got a conversation that uh i mean we've got indigenous health research uh, involved in some of our methods clusters but we haven't got a, a particular emphasis on indigenous health research uh, methodology and we need to we we need to to move in that direction and uh, I think we are committed to do that in, uh, in phase two in a, in a much fuller way and in true partnership and providing opportunities or providing the leadership to, uh, to indigenous peoples and uh, uh, researchers working uh, in that space. So that's, uh, those will be my reflections at this point. Thank you.
Thanks, Sterling. I appreciate that. We are at the end of our time together. Amber, I'm going to hand it off to you um, with one last thanks um, to the panelists and to everybody who participated today. Um, I saw the names and the faces. I'm sorry we can't have a, a more interactive dialogue, but I appreciated the folks that added to the chat and look forward to connecting again in the future. Amber? Yeah, I just wanted to echo the thanks as well. It's really, really nice to see everyone. Um, this is all the time we have. Feel free to get in touch with any one of us um, through our website. You can find our emails up there um, if you have, want any more information on the methods clusters. Um, the next session will be a poster session. There are going to be methods uh, projects reflected all across the conference uh, this year, so please please check them out. We do have a special uh, panel discussion on Methods Matters that are all Methods Cluster projects this afternoon at 2.30. So we'd love to see you there. Um, the poster session starts now at 11.30 and then we will all reconvene together at one o'clock in our plenary session. Uh, thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your conference.